First of all, I need to tell you that um, when I get to be Boyce's age, I'll very likely preach from down there. <laughs> Until then, I need to uh, hide behind this brown box. November 22nd, 1963. It's likely if you were born then and past adolescence, you remember where you were and what you were doing. I was 13 years old. I was in the eighth grade, McCullough Junior High School, South Washington Street. English class, the teacher was lecturing, and over the loudspeaker, the announcement came that President John Kennedy had been shot. At that point, we didn't know he had died, but I remember all those years ago, one year ago, do you remember where you were, what you were doing? Well, we were here. And during lunch hour, I was a little shy and didn't want to be imposing, so, and because I lived close, I decided to just go in for lunch, lunches that week. Sat down uh, in the front of the television set with my sliced turkey sandwich with tomato and a slice of cheese on it and began watching the O.J. Simpson trial. Remember that? And by the way, brother, it's six and a half million dollars now. This cost the state, I don't know what it's cost him. Also remember one other thing from those meetings. I at that time weighed 180 pounds until this man told me not to think of lemon pie. <laughs> Memories remind us of things that we already know. I don't come to you as a scholar but a learner. In fact I feel more like the one who's being taught here than the teacher Standing with you, I, I don't intend to you, uh, dazzle you with my uh, three semesters of Greek, which I have likely forgotten most of it. About four weeks ago, Brother Seth came to me. He just had a gut full, I'm sure. And he said, uh, it's not you was. <laughs> it's you are. <laughs> so I'm still struggling with English. So if I say something wrong this morning... Uh, you just let me get by with it. You want to talk to me a little bit later? That's okay. I'm still the learner. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and have told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Amen. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by, thy, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. Amen. Oh, the purity light of a single hour that before thy throne I spend, Amen. when I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Mm -hmm. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died, Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Amen. Amen. Those, my friends, are the words written by a wonderful saint called Fanny Crosby. She wrote the song to call us back to our roots. Mm -hmm. To remember the things that we have been taught and already know. And so that's what I want us to do this morning. Peter, in his first epistle, conveyed a very similar message. When he said, knowing that you were not redeemed with the perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with the uh, what? Precious. Precious blood of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Now, how could anyone, how could any two people write such words as they wrote without having first experienced being brought near mm -hmm. by the blood of Christ? Mm -hmm. Amen. It wasn't ordinary blood that God used to draw us near. He brought us into this sweet fellowship with himself by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You may not know this, but uh, it's a bit of trivia. For 15 years, I was a jeweler. 
15 years I worked with precious metals, platinum, gold, and silver. Every day I handled valuable diamonds and rubies and sapphires and emeralds. From those things I put together very expensive jewelry. But it wasn't the costly metals, it wasn't the valuable jewels that drew me near to God, only the precious blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. For my pardon, this I see. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, the blood of Jesus is priceless and precious. Amen. And rightly so, because he himself is priceless Amen. and precious. And the salvation that God offers us through the blood of Christ is Priceless Amen. and precious. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's my text. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. That text tells me that God has given me eternal access Amen. to himself through the blood of Christ which is both priceless and precious. Yes. However, there's also a negative side to this, which there usually is in any issue. Because the Holy Spirit also said, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful ex expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? I don't know if you've thought about this, but can you imagine trampling Jesus under your feet? Have you ever thought about regarding his blood as something unclean? Have you ever considered insulting the Holy Spirit and the consequence of that? You see, on one hand, we have a positive statement concerning the precious blood of Christ which draws us near to God. But we also have a negative spirit from the uh, negative statement from the Holy Spirit concerning those who fail to acknowledge and diligently treat the blood of Jesus as something worthless. Mm -hmm. So there's no question this morning. I, along with Paul and Peter and you, affirm that the blood of our Lord Jesus is inestimably and invaluably priceless and precious. Amen. Jesus poured out his own blood as a sacrificial offering in order to draw us back, draw us near to God. In so doing, he shed his precious blood to be, to, uh, as a seal of this new covenant and to purchase our redemption by paying the ultimate price. That is his life. Greater love has no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. What did he say? You are my friends. And so the blood is critically important in the New Testament because it refers to the atoning work of Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit says, how much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, 
who has treated as unholy thing the blood of the covenant. He is talking about showing abhorrence and uh, contempt and disgust for the atoning work of Christ. Amen. When the New, author, New Testament authors uh, speak of the blood, they're talking about something more and greater than the chemical makeup of the fluid that runs through our bodies. Amen. When Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins, he was confirming to the world that he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament type of letting blood and sacrifice. Bulls and goats literally gave their lives as a picture of what Jesus would one day fully accomplish by his blood and his sacrifice. The difference being, when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, he did not bleed to death. He had already given up his life. For this reason, the Father loves me, he said, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Amen. No one is taken away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. Amen. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive not from my own, he implies, but from my Father. Now, my, in my mind, there are two approaches to preaching. One is the cheerleader approach, that is... Uh, where I stand it before you and I stir you and I whip you like a milkshake into a frenzy of emotion and experience. The problem is you can get addicted to emotion yeah. and your experience, just like a drug user, becomes addicted to a narcotic and once that narcotic begins to diminish in their body, they, begin, they get depressed. In the same way, if I am here to be your cheerleader and for a few minutes I pump you up and excite you, but when that begins to fall off and drift away, you may begin to wonder if God really loves you. You ever been there? In fact, worse than that, you may begin to wonder if God really is real. Does he really exist? I don't feel like I did yesterday at church. The other approach is the cognitive approach. You've heard the word this morning. That's where you shift your brain out of neutral and you take information in like fuel and you digest that information and you assimilate that information and you make that information practical for your life. Now, I suppose if I practiced at this, I could be a cheerleader. I'm not very good at it. I never was a cheerleader. But I'd rather teach you biblical truth filled with the meat of God so that when that situation arises in your life, you'll be able to come back and recall the things that we've talked about today. You can pick up your Bible and read about these things and you'll have the answers to life's little difficulties. Mm -hmm. Now, this makes you dependent on God and not on me. Amen. You see? Amen. I, I want you to be my friends. Just like Mr. Rogers, you know. Won't you be my friend? But my friends, I'm more concerned that you be brought near by the blood of the Amen. Lamb. Amen. Amen. And be united with God in Christ. A man met a pretty young lady and fell head over heels in love for her. One day he took her rowing and she fell out of the boat. He grabbed her hair and when he did, a wig came off in his hand. And he reached down and grabbed her arm and an artificial arm came off. And he said, listen, sweetheart, if I'm going to be able to save you, you've got to cooperate a little. As we are drawn near by the blood of Christ, God wants a little cooperation on our part. Positionally in Christ, we are one. Practically, we don't always act like that, do we? 
We've already talked about the great efforts that are being made to restore unity within the church, and it's going to take time. It's very likely that that's not going to happen overnight. But in the meantime, we find Christians squabbling and bickering and fighting over the silliest things, trivial things, and unity is the farthest thing from their thinking. Ephesians 2.15 says, In Christ it was God's purpose to create in himself one new man out of the two. Amen. Thus making what? Peace. Peace. Verse 14 says that God broke down the barrier of division for he himself is our what? Peace. Who has made the two into one. Way back. Boyce brought us way back to the Garden of Eden this morning. And there was unity between God and man. Until Adam and Eve decided on their own initiative that they would take that which God had forbid them to eat and eat it. It was not long after that, in order for God to deal with sin and salvation, he set Abraham apart. But it was his ultimate goal, it was not, as Sister June said yesterday, an alternative plan. Mm -hmm. It was his ultimate goal to be completed, that salvation, through the blood of Christ. You see, in Christ, God could bring all mankind both Jew and Gentile, uh, slave and free, male and female, all mankind back into fellowship with himself. And so the matter is, in order for us to live and act as one, that is, united in Christ, and for us to love and to serve one another, we need to first understand who we are in Christ. I want you to think of it this morning like a baseball player. The player doesn't know how he's going to play that day until he knows what position he's going to play that day. In other words, the pitcher doesn't catch and a catcher doesn't play shortstop. The Christian life is very similar to that. We need a clear understanding of our position in Christ so we know how to play the game. You know what I mean by that? In position, we are one with God through Christ. Now that we know what our position is, we need to begin practicing our position so that when we get in the game, we're going to know how to play. A baseball manager tells his players they are one team. Except for the all-star game, they all come out in the same uniform. They answer to the same owner. They respond to the same coaches, and even though each one specializes in his own particular position, the goal is to win the game. If each player works together and if each player does what's required of his position, then their function begins to match their position, and theoretically, they win the game, don't they? That's the purpose. Peace is a very thin and fragile line. In recent years, many changes have taken place in our world. And it appears that men want peace. And sometimes it, it appears that, that we're moving toward peace. However, even if peace was possible, is that was or were, Brother Seth? <laughs> even if peace were possible and could be accomplished in our world in 1995, Isaiah wrote, there is no peace, says the Lord for the wicked. Amen. <laughs> in other words, as, as long as self-centered sinful people try to create peace, sin is always going to interfere. Sin is going to come in and it is going to interfere and there's going to be discord and there's going to be harmony and, and the result is no peace. Isaiah was right. By its basic definition, sin is selfishness. And when people basically look out for self, there can never be total harmony like God has called us to. That even happens in the church, doesn't it? 
I believe Jeremiah had his finger on the pulse of this situation when he said, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. In other words, as long as a man is sinful and self-indulgent, there will never be peace. Not in the world, not in the church. Amen. Now that's the bad news. You want to hear the good news, don't you? There's God. There's God. Is that not good news? Well, let's hear about it. There's God, the only one who extends down from heaven the real peace which passes all understanding. Peace can only occur when self is put to death. And the only place self can Amen. be put to death is at the foot of the cross. Amen. 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 I have been crucified with Christ, Paul said, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I live, by, uh, I live uh, uh, my life in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I like James. I, I'm anxious to meet Brother James in eternity. Because he asked this eternal question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, the battle within you? You want something and you don't get it? You kill and covet, covet, but you cannot have what you want? You quarrel and you fight? You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. What I like about James is not only does he ask the eternal question, he gives the eternal answer. <laughs> because he says, my friends, submit yourselves then to God. That's the solution, you see. Amen. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Mm -hmm. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. You see, in my mind, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 is the key. Jesus became our bridge. Sin and selfishness not only separates man and man, but sin and selfishness separates man and God. So when sin is done away with, we can become one with each other and united with God in Christ. Amen. What's the biblical word? It's the R word, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so let's turn to our text this morning. I want to show you how Jesus is the bridge. In fact, verse 13 is right in the middle. It ends one section and it begins another section. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, it says in verse 1, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love for, great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that, in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Therefore... Remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands, 
Remember that you were at, the time, at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But, but now, in Christ, you who formerly were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. It was during the 1968 presidential campaign that the town of Deschler, Ohio, became instantly famous because one of the candidates was making a whistle stop there, and a 13-year-old girl picked up a sign that someone had dropped and held it up. The sign said, Bring us together again. The news media immediately picked it up, and that girl and her city became famous overnight. I have no interest in becoming nationally famous. But I am here this morning to pick up the sign that says, Bring us together again. You see, sinful man needs reconciliation. And reconciliation means to reunite that which was once separated. Which implies that at one time they were together, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 1995 has been a very historical year for me. Uh, July 14th, I turned 45. Someone told me that's middle age, which means that I'm going to live to be 90. <laughs> on June 25th, we celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, so that means that on June the 20th, 2040, we have, will have been married 70 years. For our anniversary, we went, to, we went to Boston, spent a few days there, and then decided we'd drive down to Hyannisport, Massachusetts. And in between these two lovely cities is a little town called Plymouth. You ever heard of that city? Plymouth was made famous because that's where the pilgrims landed in America from England. Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, I'm told, lay unnoticed for 120 years until a man by the name of Thomas Fonce identified it in 1741 as the landing place of the pilgrims. I uh, bought, a, uh, bought a coffee cup uh, and I bought a lot of books too. However, on my coffee cup, I can use it for two things. There's a lot of information on the back of it, and I can drink my coffee. I never drank coffee out of a book yet. So I collect cups, not books. No, I have a lot of books, too. Anyway, my coffee cup says this. In 1775, the rock was split as it was, as it was being raised from its bed by oxen. The upper part was hauled to town square, and the remainder left on the waterfront. The rock stayed in Town Square until 1834 when it was moved to the front lawn of Pilgrim Hall on Court Street. The first section remained in its waterfront bed, and in 1849, a granite ca canopy was raised over it. In 1880, the part that, which had rested on the, on the Pilgrim Hall lawn was returned to the waterfront, and the two parts were cemented together. Did you know the rock was broken? I didn't. I've got some pictures to show you if you want. I'd like to see them afterwards. They're not very big, but this is the sign that says Plymouth Rock. Which is just to prove you that that's where we were. Is that right, where we were? Okay. <laughs> this is the granite canopy that uh, sits over the rock. And this is two pictures of the same rock. It has to be the right rock because it's the only rock I found that was engraved 1620. And there you see the crack. Well, you see where the pieces were put together. <clears throat> Jesus was sent from heaven by God to cement back together a broken relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, you can look at these pictures later if you want to. But in the meantime, I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 begins with the word therefore. We were told last night that therefore is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Something happened before that we need to take notice of and, and pay attention to the things that are said after. So verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, 
He is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Amen. Reconciliation involves three things. The sinner, the savior, and the saved. First of all, reconciliation involves the sinner. Paul said in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? You ever talk to someone who says, man is basically good. After all, the majority of people never in their entire lives will see the inside of a jail. And so they have evaluated life, good or bad, whether someone sees the inside of a jail. The problem is, we look at the surface issues, don't we? While God searches the heart. Humans tend to see actions and ignore motives. But God looks deep into the soul of man and he sees pride and rebellion. By nature we're at war with God. In fact the Apostle Paul said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. And so by nature and by action we are God's enemies. Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray, each and every one of us, put your name in there, each of us has turned, implying from God, to his own way. Enmity means animosity, antagonism, hatred, hostility, malice, vindictiveness, and eternal hell is there to be inhabited by those who choose to remain. Let's emphasize that word, remain God's enemy. An unsaved person trusts himself and depends on his own self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. A fellow had two parrots and he wanted to know which, uh, which one was the male and which one was the female bird. A man standing near said, I'm a bird expert and I can tell you. He said, if you'll notice, every time the bird eats worms, the male bird eats the male worm and the female bird eats the female worm. He said, well, how do you know which is the male and which is the female worm? He says, oh, I don't know that. I'm a bird expert. <laughs> Most of us are expert at something. Usually it's we're experts at the lesser things. Mm -hmm. Someone told me once that most people major in the minors. Paul said the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Amen. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Amen. So reconciliation... depends on a sinner. It involves a sinner. <clears throat> and the Bible's right. There's nothing that we can do on our own account to be restored back to God. So that's why reconciliation also involves a Savior. Our greatest problem as we stand without Jesus is that we are exposed and we are helpless and we are impotent. Now I... Uh, I think Brother Strauss intended to uh, get to this passage last night, but he never got to preaching. Did he? Or did he? So I want you to with me this morning turn to Romans chapter 5. By the way, I appreciate everything you said last night. We talked about it. In fact, I'm giving up my computer. Uh, you're right. It has caused us to become illiterate. I, I need to... Get back to the basics and begin studying English. Romans chapter 5, verse 7 says, 
For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. That's called valor, isn't it? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That's not something that happens in the future, my friends. Amen. Amen. That's now. Amen. God didn't need to be reconciled to man. In the garden, Adam hid from God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't search out God. God went to look for them. Amen. You realize that if God ever abandoned us, the consequence would be instant death? Even while we were yet his enemies. Even while we were yet his enemies, God would not forsake us. That's why he sent his only begotten son into the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Paul is right then, isn't he? There's nothing that we can do because God has done it all. He tore down the dividing wall of hostility. He built a bridge that spans the abyss between righteousness and unrighteousness. And now let's finish the chapter of, second, uh, of Ephesians 2 by beginning where we left off the last time. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments uh, con contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Amen. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. We talked about that last night too, didn't we? The enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were not who were near for through him we both have our have our access in one spirit to the father so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Amen. Be it known that God still hates your sin. Amen. But in Christ, God loves you. Amen. We're all like that though, aren't we? The more we love someone, the more we despise the bad things they do. God still loves those who are his enemies. That's why Jesus came to die. Not just for us, but for all people. There are a couple obstacles to man being reconciled to God. Recently at the uh, mall, there was a fight between two young men and one, one of the young men was obviously larger and stronger than the, uh, than the other. And the larger young man was pounding the smaller boy against the wall, giving this young man quite a beating. And it was fortunate that the, for the younger, smaller young fella that a janitor and another man passing by stepped in and stopped the fight. The problem is 
they stopped the fight, but they never reconciled the two boys. We don't know what happened after that. They may have gone out to the park and began whooping on one another again. God doesn't work like that, does he? He wants to remove every obstacle that stands between you and him. And so he came along and he tore down the dividing wall of hostility and he reconciled us back to himself. The first obstacle is a law which states that the soul who sins is the one who will die. And you see, God can't break his own law, can he? If he could do that, that would make him unrighteous. And he's not unrighteous, so he can't do that. He had to satisfy it. The second obstacle is our guilt. God knows everything that goes on in our hearts and our lives. I said to the folks last Sunday and the Sunday before, I think maybe, we may think that no one else in this world knows. In fact, we could probably do something and get by with it and no one else would ever know about it except God. Because nothing can be hidden from the eyes of God. The third obstacle that stands between us and God is our selfish nature. Deep, 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 deep down in our hearts, we're, uh, we are rebels. We have this rebellious nature so that when someone tells us to do something, we do the opposite. Heard, uh, heard uh, uh, an actress on the, on, the, on the news last night and, and she said, you know, when uh, someone tells me to do something, that's the exact thing that I don't do. That's what we're talking about here. Because that's the third obstacle that stands between us is, and us and God is our rebelliousness. A person outside of Christ is saying that they want to be the captain of their life. Now, they may not come out and verbalize that fact to you, but they are declaring by their actions and their life that God is not important to them. Man says, I'm not too bad. Tomorrow I, I can turn over a new leaf and I can start all over again and everything will be fine. Modern medicine has come a long way. And a doctor may be able to take the heart out of a person who is near death and put that heart into another person and restore that life. However, God is the only one who can change the heart. We can swap things, can't we? But, but even medical science can't change the heart. Only God can. Amen. Jesus came and destroyed the obstacles. He satisfied the demands of the law. He bore the guilt of our sins on the cross. And his death and his resurrection proves that he has the power to change our hearts. Amen. In our new lives, Jesus not only gives us a new position, he gives us a new disposition. Amen. Amen. God has poured out in his... In his God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who he has given us. And so being drawn near to God is, the, is a matter of reconciliation. Jesus brings us together with God. Amen. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Once we were alienated from God and were enemies in, in our own minds because of our evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If. Sometimes I hate that word. If. If you continue, in other words, it's dependent, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, God will draw you near. 
Now I want to say to you this morning that there's a third thing. That reconciliation also involves the saved. What does it mean to you personally? I mean, let's get down to the bottom line here. What does it mean to you personally to be reconciled? I know what it means to me. It doesn't mean that God has given me a second chance. If that was true, then the third time I sin, what? I'm lost. I'm done. It's over. Another thing that I recognize for myself about reconciliation personally is that reconciliation is not a temporary time out between me and God. You know, we can do it in the ball game. The referee blows his whistle and says time out and the teams go to their different sides. Reconciliation is God permanently restoring a repentant sinner back to himself through the blood of Christ. Amen. 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 You're a child of God. You have been justified by Jesus' blood. You have experienced the victory. You have security. You have victory. And you have sufficiency in Christ. In fact, the Bible tells us that everything we need for life and godliness, God has already provided. Amen. We don't need to pray for more things for life and godliness. God takes rebels and he changes them to his, be his own glory. Did you know that? We're not saved just to be saved, though that's a byproduct of our salvation. We are saved so that God can be glorified. He takes slaves and allows them to be his children. Once we were enslaved to sin, and now we've been set free. That's reconciliation. Our world is at war with God. Sinners need to know of God's plan of reconciliation through the blood of Christ. God turned his face toward us. Now it is our task as his ambassadors, to spread the good news. Our message is clear. No one in this world has to remain at war with God. Because Amen. God Amen. is not, let me emphasize that, God is not at war with us. But now in Christ, you who were once far away had been brought near the blood of Christ. Today is the day of God's grace. Tomorrow is the day of God's judgment. And I'm convinced it is time we, as believers and followers of Christ, that we get a grip. That's why it's so important for this meeting. That we get a grip on who we are. We are one with the almighty, eternal God of the universe. Nothing less. Amen. Nothing more. Christ personally carried down from heaven a message of hope and sealed the covenant with his precious blood. Christianity is a gospel of hope and involves the sinner, the Savior, and the saved. May God bless you as he continues to pour out his richest blessings on you to draw Amen. you near to himself. Amen. It's a daily process, isn't it? Amen. Amen. And God wants to do that for us. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Amen.